This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea as to the meaning of the word? It's another week. Good morning. Good morning. This is like, how many hours ahead are we recording today? Like five hours earlier than normal? Something like that? Five hours, yeah. It's 7 a.m. here. Are you even normally awake yeah. this time? I was up at five morning. Like yeah. I've already run errands. I went like oh, and got geez. sausage bisque from McDonald's. Like I was chilling on my back porch making coffee. Yeah, I was about to sit down and start writing code. And nice. then I was like, wait, something different's happening today. <laughs> yeah, we were going to record yesterday because Jason is on his way up to St. Louis to hang out for the 4th of July weekend. We didn't go you into coming down, but we should have. No, nah, I have a big week ahead of me as well, though. I'm going to be doing some traveling as well. Oh, yeah? Anything fun? Well, Drew Bragg is coming down for a few days. And I think oh, we're going to yeah. go traverse around the Grand Canyon and do some other fun stuff. Show them the sites that are not Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. Show them <laughs> some non-Oklahomian things. Oh, that sounds like fun. I'm going to have to yeah. make it out there sometime because I don't know that I've really ever stopped in that area. Like we've driven through on the way to California, but not really. I mean, we stopped at the Grand Canyon on our way back home once and mm-hmm. it was like 15 minutes. Oh my God, this is nuts. All right, let's go. We still got eight hours of driving today or whatever. But unless you're like going to go hike, there's also not a ton to do if you're just like looking at the Grand Canyon. Yeah, you can like walk around the rim, but unless you want to go do other things. Yeah, there's kind of like, oh, this is a really big hole. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Really big. This is a lot of technical debt, just like my code. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This is my node modules folder. Man. What's new with you? I saw, remember that, what was it, last night there was a new Rails version? Yes. 706, I think? Yes. 706 was released last night. It looked like it had Um, a bunch of bug fixes and stuff. Nothing got backported to 6.1 or whatever. Yeah, there was some action cable changes. It looks like one change. Nothing was specifically called out in the release notes. Nothing action mailbox, nothing action mailer. Do you think this is them getting ready, preparing, maybe possibly for Rail 7.1? No, I don't. <laughs> because I'm like sifting through like the changes so far and there's only changes in like a handful of libraries. Of course, Active Record though. Active Record's got some changes. What's interesting Fix- is it was like a lot of bug fixes, which maybe normally would end up in like 7.1 if that was going to come out soon or whatever. So those would have had to been applied to both. But some of these changes in active records seem pretty, pretty slick. I know, uh, was the Janko tweeted a while back about, I think you just saw that tweet yesterday again, that sub queries were not working and then they were fixed in this release. It was like when you do like a nested select, those like didn't work at all or something in the latest version, but. Fix result with anonymous Postgres call. No, that's not that. It was in there somewhere, I thought. Or maybe, yeah, it's the fix where an association with has one has many polymorphic oh, relationships because it's like treasure where price estimates and then you pass in price estimates dot all. So it's got a sub select in there. Yes. Which is cool. I mean, it's super cool that like you can just pass in a query into a query and then a query, a query, fix innumerable in order of to only flatten first level to preserve. Nesting, that's interesting because I just used that this weekend or really? this week, but I don't have any nesting stuff. We're integrating GitHub deployments into the new Hatchbox so you can track your deploys. So we wanted to like pull the Rails env for the environment and then fall back to like Rack env or Node env, like depending on if you're deploying a Rails app or not, or a Ruby Rack app or Node or even adding like a prefixed one that's like GitHub environment so that you can specify like that separately. If you wanted a different value for what shows up in your environment in GitHub environments and deployments, we can do that. And so basically it was like, well, we can query for any of those keys, but then we got to sort by the key in Ruby land. And then we got to pull the first one and grab the first value. And like, that's not so bad. You just call like sort with a block and 
grab the first entry or whatever, but I was like Rails 7, I'm pretty sure added that in order of, and it did at least the active record query methods. I don't, I guess innumerable has had that in order of for a while before that. So that may be like a separate feature that's just, you know, arrays and active record relations or whatever intended to operate as similarly as they can. And that method is awesome. It's just like, cool. You know what? We'll grab these entries. I believe it also did the where for us. So it didn't return any other environment variables, just the ones we're looking for. And then bam, we're set. And it was like one of those lines of code where you're like, okay, this is going to get a little nasty. And then yeah. you end up using that feature and it's like, wow, it's so clean. So simple. I was impressed. That's interesting. Now that you like kind of talked about it a little bit more, I'm like, this might be something I could use on something I just wrote. Yeah. Do you have a similar situation that you were sorting stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Where I yeah. like want the records in a certain order, and but I'm doing it on the Ruby side. Yeah, I'll have to look uh-huh. at that. I'm curious about the GitHub deployment stuff, though, because I have long desired, like literally since the days of Code Fund, which was 2019, like the ability to create GitHub deploys from Heroku, yep. which is difficult yeah, on so many levels. Is My understanding was that Heroku is still using GitHub OAuth because they were like, they predated GitHub apps. I don't know. There may be permissions for that in the API, but some of their APIs are like only for GitHub apps or whatever. And we used right. to use GitHub OAuth and now we use GitHub apps. And it's a very different process and it's kind of confusing and their docs are terrible. Like if you look at the only place in their docs that I could find any example of like how does deployments work is this one page that has a ASCII, I don't know what you call those graphs, but it's like tooling sends a message over here and then it sends a message back. And yeah, the, yeah. This, like a network you know, diagram. Like, yeah, exactly. And uh, it basically says like tooling talks to GitHub to create a deployment. And then GitHub tells the third parties, which then actually do deployment and SSH in and do the thing on your server. But it's like you create the deployment, the deployment sends a deployment webhook event to the third parties, but we're both. We're the tooling because you click deploy and right. the third party. And so our initial version of this actually creates the deployment and then updates the statuses all during the deploy. But I think long term we'll end up having like our deploy button create a deployment in GitHub, which then sends us a webhook back, which actually is the thing that triggers the deployment. But then they also explain that in your GitHub actions, you can tag a job as whatever environment. Yeah. But that will create a deployment there. But then it's like, I guess you have an empty job that does nothing because the webhook would trigger the deployment. There's like no information about how like you're supposed to set these things up. It's so confusing. So we were like, let's do the simple version first. So that's where we landed. And it's been working on our test apps and stuff. So we're going to launch that shortly. But it's so confusing. And a company the size of GitHub. And there's already plenty of other integrations that people have done. Why don't you have some explanation on this? Because I don't know, probably Netlify or Vercel or whatever that uses this stuff probably just have a relationship with people at GitHub to like straight ask those questions, but we're small. We don't have like an account manager kind of person to talk to and get answers from. It's annoying. I hate those API integrations like that. Yeah. They're just kind of guessing on how it's supposed to work because they couldn't be bothered to document it well. (laughs) Yeah. The checks API, which is kind of adjacent to the deployment, the CSV, like GitHub action stuff, the documentation for that was super confusing. I haven't looked at it in like a year or two, but at the time it was like, I don't understand why I have to have like this other thing here. They were like, you need to have like this back and forth. And I'm like, why do I need a whole Rails app to send <laughs> Ruocop annotations? And I think that's changed a little bit, but it was like, well, I don't understand why this is so complicated. Why can't I just do this? Yeah. The way it yeah, feels that's... like it should be done. That's kind of how it felt like. I mean, I understand that you need a deployment and then you can create statuses for it to like update it. But 
the like deployments into webhook and all that seems in a similar situation. And then of course, yesterday right. GitHub was down like completely, which is a big hesitation on my end, which is like, well, if you click the deploy button and we've got to create a deployment in GitHub and then wait for the webhook, your app's never going to deploy. And now we've yeah. introduced a terrible situation by setting it up that way. And so I was like, I don't know. I'm not sure I want to do it that way. The other thing I thought about too was like, maybe we just create the deployment as part of the queuing up the deploy job. Then maybe we save the ID and then I assume the webhook would send the same ID over and we could deduplicate and make sure we don't just trigger it twice or whatever. Bold so, assumption. Bold yeah. assumption <laughs> alert. I know. That's like why we didn't do it yet. Cause it was like, we definitely do not want to be dependent on GitHub then for right. deployments. It just doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I'm sure the like answer is pretty straightforward or something when you like hear how it's intended to be used, but there's no information on that, of course. I'm not talking smack because like Heroku takes our app offline whenever it feels like to do whatever it feels like. But at the same time, I feel like GitHub is down more than a lot of the other applications I use. It certainly has been in the last few years, I feel like. I'm not saying it's unreliable or anything. I'm just saying I've Is seen it, it go they're down. they're moving it all over to Azure? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever was going on at GitHub yesterday, we were like, why aren't our GitHub actions finishing? And me and my coworker go into one and we're like, oh, this has been running for two hours. Downloading yeah. at one, one, 0 0.1 megabits per second. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we're like, okay, just <laughs> stop all of this. Stop. But I'm pretty like, sure we get charged for that. That's the weird part. Oh about yeah, it right, right. You definitely do. We got charged for this and she was there's like, not a, I'm like, yeah. There's definitely not like a quality of service check in there that's like, hey, if this is not running at optimal speed or like a bare minimum speed, then we don't charge you for it. They're like, yeah, oh, whatever. There's times yeah. where I'll push up like a, a commit or something or a PR to the pay gem. And that one's one where we've got a stupid amount of, I don't remember if we support back to Ruby 2.6 or whatever it is. But we have at least three or four Ruby versions that we test against. And then all of those are tested against the same number of Rails versions. So it's like 16 things. Oh, yeah. Because we also test against three different databases. We're so we've a, got a, a lot a of oh, yeah. cubed here. Yeah, exactly. So we end up with like lots of permutations of things to run. And I know lately we have had a few times where like a PR would happen. And like all but one of them would have finished, completed successfully. And the last one's just sitting there queued for like an hour. <laughs> and I was like, are yeah. you serious? I know that it's not going to fail. 99.9% .9 chance it will not fail because everything else is fine. But you're like, do I hold out and wait for this or just hit merge? Yeah, I'm more of a forgiveness asker instead of permission asker, so... Yeah. Like, sorry, guys, I broke main. Yeah, no big like, deal. So quick. You can um, put timeouts and you get it back. I want to say that. Like, you can tell it to time out after a certain amount of time. And I can feel you do like that that's with, just... Uh, when it's, like, sitting in queue? Can you see, have that, it, like... That is, I'm like, a sure. different situation. Like, ours is actually running. I doubt... Because if it's in the queue, you shouldn't be getting charged for it. Right. And it's open source, so it's right. a free thing anyways. But that's a crazy thing, too, because they're footing the bill for all that the open source right. actions and whatever. And it's quite a bit of like time that I know we had posted that and Mike Cowdermarsh had replied on Twitter. It was like, thanks for keeping the servers warm for us. <laughs> Cause I was tweeting about how many different permutations we end up running. And yeah, yeah. he was one of the guys who worked on that back yeah. in the day. Now back he's at day. old planet scale. Scaling yep. those databases. That's funny thing you should mention that because oh, my hat. Oh, see the hat. <laughs> yeah. I'm wearing a plant of scale hat at the moment. That I'm pretty sure I got from Mike or one of his from coworkers Mike. at yeah at a conference. They do some sweet stuff. It is a super cool product and stuff. But of course, I think because of Heroku, we've all kind of defaulted to Postgres. But I know GitHub runs on MySQL, and that's why they're doing that. And 
There's Base a lot camp. of strong MySQL experts out there. But of course, you've also got the equivalent with crunchy data and tons and tons of Postgres experts out there too. So I don't think you can really go wrong with either one. But yeah, yeah. And, uh, Postgres is looking quite delectable recently with the new crunchy data stuff. Yeah. And there's some cool new things that I think Craig from Crunchy Data was talking about with the new, what is it, Postgres 16 or something that's coming out soon? Something like that, yeah. Didn't they put it like on WebAssembly? Yeah, that sounds they familiar. Did some, they did something where they put it like in the web and I was like, whoa, Postgres yeah. in the web. <laughs> yeah, which databases. is like a wild concept. I think you have something sort of like that in local storage i thought had like a sqlite esque database oh yeah no i think you're something right like that or i could I be thinking of mobile or something too no i know what you're talking about i wonder if people are building on that yeah i don't know so i'm always uh, scared to put things in the browser it's one of those things where everybody wants their spas but your application's performance is 100 percent dependent on instead of just the network connection it's also the device performance and everything you lose a lot of control about how well your application runs that way. Luckily, a lot of devices are better performance-wise these days, but that's maybe more of us in the U.S. than in the Western yeah. world or something than I mean, even all in parts the world. of the U.S. Like I've been, like yeah, I had a friend true. who lived way outside the city, and the difference between not even just the option, like they didn't even have the option to get cable. Yeah. So like they had to use like the Verizon or the AT and T like wireless routers that go through like the 3g but even that wasn't very good. so like they're running on like that and like people in rvs and stuff i know there are some great options out there but i know a lot of people don't have them <laughs> yeah even where we built our house we can't really get cell service from t-mobile or at&t or anything so it depends on like where we're at on our property that you can kind of get it but thanks to phones having wi-fi calling or whatever these days I never notice it now that our house is done and we have Wi-Fi everywhere, but it was absolutely a thing where I'd have to like walk up to the road and then make oh. a phone call or whatever. And then randomly you could like receive text messages, but you definitely couldn't send them back out. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like weird because you're like, why was I able to receive the message at all if I can't send one? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? My but, last house was in a weird little dead zone, so I know I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's terrible. I was just thinking about, this is a fun story. So yesterday, somebody asked about the new Hatchbox having jump server support. So basically, if you have a bunch of servers that you want to keep protected from the public internet, you have one server that has public internet access, and then we can just log oh, into that. Yeah jump to the ones in the private network and you just yeah, need yeah. to really secure that one main server. So somebody asked about that and we've had that support in the old Hatchbox for a long, long time, many years. And I was like, oh, cool. So Andrew Hodson and I sat down yesterday and we're like, oh, we'll just copy these five lines of code from the old Hatchbox classic and pop them in the new one. And it didn't work. And we ended up down this rabbit hole of like, reading through and debugging the internals of the net SSH gem and a wild rabbit hole to the point where we're like, we're dealing with garbage collection concerns and stuff. Oh, so no. we went from the easiest sounding feature to like, oh God, now we're like trying to make sure that this is done correctly. And so what happened was, and I'm still not entirely sure what the difference is between the old version and the new version, there's really around the net SSH stuff, like basically everything's exactly the same. But when we do the jump server, net SSH will actually run the SSH command and then open a socket through that to the final destination. And the jump proxy in the net SSH Ruby library that executes the SSH command with a bunch of flags and what we were running into was it was basically like prompting for host verification. And I'm not sure if it's just my local SSH on my Mac wasn't, I don't know if it was different or whatever. I haven't right. tested the old versions stuff recently. But anyways, the host verification stuff we have to ignore because 
people will delete a server and then like DigitalOcean will reuse that IP address. And like, if we didn't ignore that, then we had to like edit our known host file a bunch of times and that would be a mess. So we just kind of ignore it because it doesn't really matter for our purposes like it would for you connecting to your own servers. So we have that flag on there and turn on the proxy stuff and it just like doesn't seem to be listening to that. And I get reading through the code and it's like, yeah, it actually runs a totally separate SSH thing first. Um, and that doesn't actually listen to any of the configuration options that you give it, really. Of course. So we ended up basically reading through the source code of NetSSH to figure out, oh yeah, it just ignores that. So we fork NetSSH and add our own little flags to it to like skip that. And that works fine. And you can provide it like a SSH config file. And I was like, this is fine, but we've got to create two things. Put our SSH private key for your cluster in a temp file and then provide that to the SSH command. But we also got to create a config file temporarily to define the jump server details. And I was like, surely we can pass like most of this stuff on the command line. I don't think we can pass our like private key on the command line, but that's okay. So we get it looking into it and it's like, yeah, it doesn't support any of these options. So we got to go put that in there. And then we get to that point of we're already passing in the SSH keys as like a string instead of like a file on disk. So we get into that bit and we're like, well, the proxy can read the like initial SSH configuration and that has the keys in it. So we could just read that and then in that SSH, write a temp file and then pass that along to our SSH jump proxy command. And that would be great. Same thing. It basically like would have the private key just like the regular SSH command and whatever. Well, then we go try that out and we're like, make a temp file, write the data, grab the path, pass it in. Turns out that the temp file class in Ruby, if you're not paying close attention to it, there's a temp file dot new and a temp file dot create. And a temp file dot create will actually return you a file object, but temp file dot new will return a temp file object. Right. And as it turns out too, we were using temp file dot new because that's what it says in the majority of the docs in Ruby's docs. So we're using that and it says write the file. And then if you do like a block, it'll clean itself up automatically. And we're like, okay, great. That's what we want. So I like make the temp file, write to it, and then take the path and give it to SSH. And it's like invalid format for the key. And we're like, oh God. And then of course, by the time that we like go and look for that file, like it's been cleaned up because the Ruby process has removed it or garbage collected it or whatever. So (laughs) we're like, okay. I guess we got a binding IRB in the middle of this before it cleans the temp file up and then go read the contents. And if you like read the contents with Ruby and like rewind, it will read it back to you just fine. But without the close to actually write it to disk on the operating system, the SSH command was saying it was an invalid format because the file was still empty, but it had been like written in Ruby or something. And then I got reading the docs some more and I switched temp file create which actually flushed it to disk right away or something. And then that one was leaving files around. So then we're like, well, maybe we'll go back to tempfile.new because where the code was, we couldn't just like wrap it in a block to have it automatically cleaned up easily. So our solution was basically let's write with tempfile new, close the file, make sure it gets written to disk. It connects, or we thought it was going to connect It didn't give us that error, the same error, because I think our method where we were creating the key returns the path, but that method was just creating the temp file in a local variable. So it would like be ready for garbage collection right after that. And then we realized like, oh, we probably need to store this like in an instance variable in an array because that way our proxy instance or retain a reference to the temp file so that if the garbage collector happened to run at the right second, chances are it could clean up the file before the SSH command actually gets to it. And we were like, oh God, this turned out to be 
way more complex than we were expecting at all. But I think it might end up turning into like a contribution or a couple to the net SSH gem because there's a few open issues from 2019 that are exactly the same problems that we were running into. But dealing with temp files, normally, if you were just like doing active storage processing, you're like, download the file, all this code in this block needs to run, and then we can clean up the file and the block's done. In our case, it's like you make a proxy class, you create these command line options, you give that back to this other class. And we had no easy place to like clean up those. And it was an interesting problem just seeing you may not actually think about the garbage collector and this might work fine 99% of the time and then break randomly once. And then you just tell the customer like, I tried it again and it worked fine. And it might be one of those mysterious bugs or whatever, if you just weren't thinking about, well, there's this thing called the garbage collector, which you don't even think about 99% of the time in Ruby, but you definitely don't interact with it. So we ended up, I think, doing the right thing, thinking about that stuff as we wrote that code. But I got reading into Gemma's blog a little bit about it because I didn't know entirely how the GC operates. That variable, if we were to instantiate it in a method real fast, write the file, return the path to it, it's considered like a young but purgeable variable because it's a local variable that's not hanging around for long or anything. I don't know entirely if I'm doing it right, if I even need to do that, but it's hard to find like information on exactly those details of how the GC works and stuff. But it may be a question I'll have to ask Gemma or somebody else who's very familiar with the GC. But yeah, we got in the weeds. Yeah, dang. <laughs> I also feel young and purgeable. I just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, HoneyBadger.io. Do you currently use one service for uptime monitoring, another for error tracking, another for status pages, and yet another to monitor your cron jobs and microservices? Paying for all of those services separately may be costing you more than you think. If you want to simplify your stack and lower your bills, it's time to check out HoneyBadger. HoneyBadger combines all of those services into one easy platform. It's everything you need to keep production healthy and your customers happy. Best of all, Honey Badger is free for small teams and setup takes as little as five minutes. Get started today at honeybadger.io. That's honeybadger.io. Thinking about yesterday, like I'm solving all these bugs. I'm trying to figure this out. Like I'm matching mockups. And then at no point was ever like, yeah, maybe it's the garbage collector. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know when my brain would ever get to that point of like, oh yeah, right here, that's the garbage right. collector. <laughs> And I think the only reason it came to mind was like, I know it's a temp file and I don't want to accidentally fill my disk with a whole bunch of these old files right. that we don't need anymore. So I think that was really the only reason why I realized, how do we make sure this file gets cleaned up after it's used? And so we can like run a deployment. And at the end of that, if the file is still there, then we know it didn't clean up properly. But if it wasn't, that's good. Or we might run it and the file still exists, but I can just trigger gc.start and the right. file disappears. So then I know that even if it's not immediately cleaned up, it will be cleaned up because we had definitely like seen ones, I think it was the tempfile.create. That was the one that was like, I'm just reading the docs, trying things at that point. Why is this not readable by SSH? If I right. write it manually with file.write, it's fine. So something's wrong with my temp file stuff. And we just kind of stumbled on that when we were like, all right, let's do our due diligence. Let's make sure that we clean up properly. And this is tricky because we can't just use the block version, which would be like the ideal, unless we were to go even deeper into the net SSH integration. If there was a proxy option, then go check the proxy and see if it has temp files and then unlink all of those. And there was like no tear down callback on the proxy object right. itself to do that in the right place. So it was like, obviously a lot more complicated than because it didn't have a callback thing, which really gives you appreciation for like active support callbacks and all the stuff that Rails provides you out of the box because you can actually inject things as you need them pretty much anywhere, which is solid. Right. That's an interesting yeah. problem. Yeah, it was a fun one. From the business perspective, was not a great use of our time, but it was a fun <laughs> programming challenge. <laughs> right, right, right. 
Yeah, but, sometimes yeah. what is good for the brain is not good for the business. I mean, it's great to be able to like do those challenging things and then become a better Rubyist and stuff. You're just like, I will, at least for the foreseeable future, keep in mind more of that stuff as I go. Like, do I need to save this variable in an instance variable if it just is going to be a temporary thing? No, then we shouldn't do that. We will actually use more memory than we need to, and we should be good citizens of our code and operating system and whatever by doing that stuff. And I think it's it's one of those things where like you learn about instance variables, you see them used in examples, and you just kind of use them. And as you go, you don't have any problems with it, so you just keep doing that pattern. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, how often is this going to be used? How complex is it to query this, create a new version of this? If it's not making any network requests, then you can probably instantiate this thing pretty fast and tear down pretty fast, right? which can help your memory usage, but also it might take more CPU or more time or whatever to go do that stuff. So in some cases, memory is a trade-off for performance and it's hard to like think about those things when you're just trying to make the darn thing work the first time around. But the more and more you get into building products and then especially stuff like the size of Podia and having to worry about like launch days or Black Friday, I'm sure is a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. Those are like the times when all the performance trade-offs of, well, do we use more memory or like throw more stuff into memcache or do we just keep it however it is? And don't cash or whatever for hope, hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to do that stuff. Cause like Nate Perkopec had tweeted about what was their 40% increase or something crazy on Gusto's yeah. uh, page load times. Like what? That's something, crazy. Something wild. <laughs> yeah. Even just realizing how to release features in the first place can be like pretty challenging. I think we're going through that at Podi right now. We're releasing like a really challenging feature, but then we're also like building onto it at the same time. I'm laying in bed last night and I'm like about to go to sleep. I like snap up in bed and I'm like, because we didn't do this thing, then people who were opted into that feature flag are not going to get this other thing, which they would have gotten if they weren't on the feature flag. And I'm like, <laughs> oh no. And then I just like laid back down in bed. I'm like, well, guess I'll deal with that tomorrow. Yeah, and the it's nightmares like, that you have. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> you realize there's a lot of coordination, a lot of communication and on top of just the code itself. I love how those like little things that you learn, like kind of you're like, yeah, I learned some about the garbage collector. Now in the future, maybe I'll recognize that problem a lot faster. That's why I read so much code because if I can recognize the problem, then I can arrive at the solution so much faster. Like yesterday, we were trying to figure out, okay, well, we need a little bit more security on this updates coming through on this form. Like we want to make sure it's only for these things and we want to relate it to only published things. And we're like, okay, but how do we know if something's published? And we're like, well, it's not on this record. And it's like an instance method on this other method. And we're like, but then it's delegated to this other model. And I'm thinking in my brain, I'm like, there's a way to do this. (laughs) And then it's somewhere my brain was like, join, join. (laughs) I just stopped. I was like, wait, we can join onto that other model, get those things that we need, get that security that we want. And then we're just good. And it was like, but I didn't have to know how to write the join off the top of my head. It was just remember this problem from somewhere in the past. Yeah. And you're like, I know how to do this. Yeah. I think what I really liked was, you know, working for my first Rails job was like at a consulting agency. So we get like a different project every single week. I didn't get to go in depth on a lot of things like do now, which is a whole different learning experience. But man, just seeing all of those different things that I was thrown at, And having to like figure it out quickly and then being able to like six months later, like, oh yeah, we did that on this other project. We did it this way. We can use that same approach or like that's our starting place and we can do something better even because I've learned stuff between now and then. And that is a wonderful thing about programming. It's different too, because a lot of people get stuck in a job where they only do the same things forever and they don't get to experience a lot of new things. And it's hard to learn then if you're just like doing the same stuff every single yeah. day. And I've been there. 
That's why I yeah. have left companies before. It's like, I don't want to write this type of code forever. It's like, I feel stuck here. Like, there's no way up. It's like, I'm doomed to be doing what I'm doing right now forever. And <laughs> I don't even like what I'm doing. Yeah. And I think big companies have that problem more because they have so many people and it's like, everybody's kind of specialized on one thing. Right. You're the Twitter button color guy. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> You just make sure all the buttons are that perfect shade of blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's nice is the smaller companies do give you a lot more challenges and and different things. And I don't know about you, but I really feel happiest when I am learning new stuff as a programmer. That is where I will really feel burnt out if I'm just doing the same stuff over and over again. I don't know. It accelerates my burnout a lot if I'm just not learning anything new or whatever. Yeah. Or if you're stuck on the same project for like, that's when I start yeah. feeling burned out. Is I feel like we've been doing the same thing for so long and I don't even see the end in sight still. And <laughs> it's like, it feels like it's getting more and more and you're like, I just don't want to do this. I hear that. It is very hard sometimes because some features are giant and there's yeah. no way to really break them down without it being totally unusable for users. You can't chop it up. It'd be yeah. like shipping GitHub Actions with a fraction of the functionality and it already right. like shipped without a whole ton of features people needed so they just like get swamped with it doesn't do this and it doesn't do that and it's not as complete as circle ci and whatever and it's like yeah this is our version one of it sorry but like that's how it goes but yeah. even then like they got to build massive infrastructure and other things behind the scenes to like pull off github actions just period because they're right. building things that Especially as your company gets bigger, like you guys have what tens, hundreds of thousands of creators on there. So like any feature you make has to actually not break any one of those users. And when you have a lot smaller user base, it's like literally any feature you add, somebody's going to use it in some weird way. And you still have to make sure you take that stuff into account when you deploy new things, which just slows down. It's probably why a lot of the companies like Slack and Stripe and whatever, as they get big, the like feature shipping just slows to a crawl because it's like, well, we committed to this and people are using it. So now we got to figure out if we're going to undo that, what does that look like? How do we not break all our users' API calls or whatever the heck? And it ends up being a very costly thing. So I feel that luckily we're kind of small still. Can, yeah. We can move fast and garbage collect things. <laughs> yeah. There's like impact to it too. At certain companies, there's been like varying levels of impact of like me breaking code. And at the end of the day, I'm the type of person, I feel like Jason's kind of the same way of like code gets broken. Yeah. You know? Things yeah. happen. I'd never expect to not ship a bug. But what I do expect is that I will be able to find and fix it quickly. And yeah. that's kind of just what I've been saying. Like, look, I'm going to break things because I move fast, but I'm going to be able to fix them quickly. And I have kept to that. But for me, like when I'm thinking about shipping things to Podium, I'm like, okay, well, if I ship this and like it's possibly broken, then the impact is like someone might be able to change this color. And it's like, okay, well, you know, yeah. that's that impact. But then there's the other end of the impact as well. Someone is using this to make their living. And if we break this, then there's this whole different level of impact. And you really have to like weigh that and like make those decisions Yep. Well, you have to think yeah. about that. That's very important to think about when you're deploying features, when you're thinking about, okay, well, should we just deploy this or should we put this behind a feature flag? I'm a big fan of feature flags. So I like to feature mm-hmm. flag lots of things, but like shout okay, maybe Flipper. Yep. Shout Flipper. It's like, well, <laughs> maybe this feature flag is like, actually, we want to even add another one just because this feature flag is working. Like what if this other thing that we're tagging on top of it doesn't work? So much planning. It's time to wake up, Chris. That is my cue to go spritz the pork shoulder that's smoking on the Traeger. Smoke some cream cheese this morning, which I've never done before. That's good. It's so good. So this weekend, I'm making, obviously, pulled pork and some smoked cream cheese. But that smoked cream cheese was a test to see if I want to do that in some Texas Twinkies. Which if anybody doesn't know, that's jalapeno with like brisket or pulled pork, cream cheese, maybe some cheddar cheese inside the jalapeno, wrapped in bacon, covered in seasoning, smoked on the smoker. Then you can even, if you want, do some like 
barbecue sauce or pepper jelly on top and like you know, hey. tack that on there. So it's a real American thing, I think. Texas Twinkie. And seems very fitting for the 4th of July weekend. Maybe I'll All put right. some bottle rockets inside of them too. Give you a little, I can, little kick. If I can make it to the airport in 30 minutes, I can be there by two. <laughs> well, <laughs> we won't have those until tomorrow or something. So Okay, perfect. You, then you I'll be there at 4.30 a.m. Spirit <laughs> Airlines. One stop. Boom, boom. <laughs> well, I bought the pulled pork from Costco thinking mm-hmm. it was like a bone-in one. Oh. No, it turned out it was like two eight pound boneless ones. So it's just 16 pounds of meat. Six. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, just well, meat. I was like, well, that's a lot more than I thought it was going to be. That's but, a lot uh, of meat. Yeah, but it'll be good. Last time, if I remember correctly, your pulled pork had enough seasoning where I was like, I don't need to douse this with stuff. But yeah. like, you like to put anything on your pulled pork. If I make it into a sandwich or something, I'll put like some barbecue sauce and coleslaw on it. But yeah, usually like my goal is if I can make the barbecue so you don't need sauce, then yeah, that's the that's goal. solid. And the way to do that is basically just buy anything from Meat Church. Their seasonings are super awesome, which reminds me, I got to go pick up their new, it's like not that new, it's like six months old or something, but they got a new seasoning that... He won barbecue competitions with it, and it was like just that seasoning, which is like oh, wow. usually they do more fancy stuff to it. But he was like, yeah, you just put that on some ribs or whatever. And his stuff is phenomenal. This one, I tried to go a little bit fancier this weekend, inject it with apple juice. So it's just like, hopefully can it be real juicy inside? To still. get it drunk. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then spritz it with apple cider vinegar. Okay. Slather it in mustard and then we put honey bacon barbecue seasoning from Meat Church on there. Mm. And oh man, it's good. But mm. he said it was an hour per pound is what the recipe said. And I was you like, well... 16 pounds. Yeah. Well, last night I was like, I read the label on the thing and I was like, 16 pounds? This is going to take 16 hours? And then I cut it open and it was like, oh, this is like split in half. So there's like two. So fingers crossed, I'm going to run it for like eight, 10 hours or something because mm-hmm. there's two. Hopefully it'll cook it all, but we'll see. There's definitely been a few evenings where it's like, oh, plan for dinner at six. PM's rolling around. It's still right. not up to temperature. <laughs> it's a little bit of an art sometimes. I bet you have a love for propane and propane accessories. Mm, Speaking of that, there's a propane outlet. We're in the country, so we have a propane tank that's buried underground because we don't have natural gas from pipeline or anything. So, any natural gas? No, just the old Taco (laughs) Bell. (laughs) Jason will be there later, right? Yeah. But yeah, we actually sort of planned to eventually do a built in outdoor kitchen. So, we have a The propane comes into the house and also like has a little thing that comes out the wall where we plan to put the kitchen. So one day we'll have propane grill, got the smoker and the smoker's fine for like grilling, but also like doesn't really get as hot as charcoal or propane or whatever. So propane, it's still really good. There's been a few times where like grease caught on fire and then it, that grill got up to like mm. 800 degrees in there. So yes. I thought I was going to burn the house down, but yeah, don't you got to live Andrew. and learn. You got to experiment and try things, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I'll tell you, I've experimented with fire in your houses. They don't work really well together. <laughs> you got a whole setup over there. I'm like, yeah, I know how to use a cast iron pan. Oh, man. I saw on Reddit the other day. I don't know why, but of course, Reddit is now recommending r slash cast iron and yeah, because all the other subreddits shut down because yeah, well yeah that's true it's like we got nothing else to serve you because everybody's yeah, because everyone did you see like what you're doing reddit was trying to petition some moderators to reopen some yes. of the channels and stuff so there's something that they were trying to petition some of the moderators and so the moderators just made every single person in the subreddit a moderator as well because uh, it yeah. was something they were trying to like reopen it or whatever. But then the moderators were like, well, we're still going to just have pure chaos. So they opened that up and they were like marking a bunch of stuff as like 
not safe for work, even though yeah, just yeah, like, yeah, whatever. So that way, like, if we have to have the subreddit open, then it can't be recommended because it's not safe for work or whatever. And, Which is just crazy to begin with. The fact that Reddit's like, hey, we don't have the manpower to like moderate the communities in our website, right. so we're going to have unpaid people do it for free. But when they don't do what we want them to do, we're going to threaten to like boot them all and establish our own. And we're like, we know you can't establish your own moderator team. Stop threatening that. Yep. <laughs> we know you can't yeah. do that. It's crazy. They've been so like aggressive yes. against the community for whatever reason. And it's like, do you guys not realize that those people are the reason why you make money? So you're yeah. trying to make more money off of them, but you've got to like care about them. I'm so pissed off about it. It's been, like Steve Huffman, who's the CEO of Reddit, has just been acting like an absolute fool on the it, timeline. He has. Yeah. It's so weird He's to like, not be. appreciate any of your users like that. It's so strange. Today is the last day. So like we're recording on June 30th. And so today is the last day the Reddit API is available. So tomorrow, my favorite app oh, like yeah. that I spend the most time on is just done. Yeah. But the developer is on the hook for refunds. I saw like, that. Because uh, if the you're, Apollo guy? Yeah. Like, so if you've like purchased subscriptions, which is 30 days is insanity to be like, hey, yeah. we're cutting this down. Because when Apple bought Dark Sky, they left the API available for like more than six months. I think they even extended it beyond that because they're like, hey, we yeah. know you're using this. Well, like, we want you to move over. But like my guess the 30 is, days is insane. My guess is somebody's not telling the full story and that Reddit's financials may be looking pretty bad or something no, right you know now. What it, Reddit's trying to go has been trying to go public for a while now. That's why they stopped allowing like NSFW on the front page and they brought in new people to like try to usher them into this public thing. And they're like, yeah, it will get a crap ton more money if we do what Elon did, start charging for our API. And it's just like, Terrible. you're destroying like moderation tools. You're destroying like people's <laughs> not, livelihoods. Like, Have you not seen how Elon's been destroying Twitter? Yeah, like, yeah. Why would you want that as your North Star that you're like, oh, we yeah. should copy this. He's my hero. Well, no, it's dude, just, they're uh, just thinking in bank signs. What I really do not like is because the... Ruby on Rails subreddit went dark, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I understand doing that for the support of the community. But what sucks is like, and Google doesn't really have the cache links like it used to on the search yeah, results. Yeah, no, I've noticed that. And if those were still there, it would be fine if Reddit went dark because I'd still be able to find the answer that shows up in the search results. But having the subreddits go dark, it doesn't hurt Reddit as much as it hurts the Ruby and Rails communities when nobody can get answers from the top Google search results. So like I get it and wanting to support the community against Reddit's doing, but it also ends up hurting your own community when you do that and just turn it off like that. So it's just a tough thing. If there was an alternative, like here's the content on Reddit and we can still access it, then it'd be one thing. I would definitely say like, Oh, let's go turn off the subreddit and make it go dark. But I can't tell you how many times I ran into that over those few days, just searching for random things and being like, oh, here we go again. Can't yeah. use Reddit. I saw this the other day. Google literally had a meeting. Yeah, an all hands meeting because they realized that because the subreddits were going dark, they were having complaints from users. So like oh, the that. subreddit is going dark literally decreased the value of Google search. Yeah. Let's go, oh, it baby. Certainly did. Yeah. I'm all in, dude. Like, I'm like, shut everything down. Like, this is ridiculous. They uh, shouldn't be able to do this to like people who are doing this for free. And like, sure, it's your website. And if you want to come in and take over everything, go right ahead because then see what happens. Because yeah, you're trying to take like, the entire core of Reddit because the amount of people who've participated in this blackout has been like telling. Yep. Yeah. It is one of those things where it's like, okay, you guys have been like, well intentioned for so many years, but as it always goes, no, they haven't. We're not. I mean, Reddit's Some just kind of dark like stuff in Reddit history. Too. Well, well, yes, but also like let's just take the Rails and Ruby subreddits. Okay, 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 okay. It's been like a alternative to Stack Overflow. Like Stack Overflow doesn't allow for conversation. It's basically right. like here's a question, you must answer it, and that's about it. And you have those tiny little comments underneath that are like. 
eh, this doesn't work in where, this case. Whatever. Where the real answer is. Yeah, exactly. And there's never been like the equivalent place for just general conversation about Ruby or Rails or whatever, like asking about jobs and whatever, right. or interviews or something. So Reddit like took that place. But what's unfortunate is Reddit was just here, have a forum and people adopted it, which was great. You're already on Reddit doing other things. So it makes sense to use that. But like the Ruby or Rails communities really need to like invest more than in the discourse or equivalents or the docs or whatever so that we can like have our own stuff that we control that actually has a lot of investment on SEO. So those results show up above Stack Overflow or Reddit or whatever it is. And I always feel like I'd never, ever stumble across the Rails discourse. I don't either. Sometimes in like GitHub issues. Yeah, but very rarely. And it seems like that stuff could get improved so that where the answers are or the conversations are should be something controlled by or owned by the community at the Rails Foundation or whatever it is. And maybe that's a thing that we can do as part of the community or the Rails, get involved with the Rails Foundation and have that as a future goal or something. But it's one of those moments that shows like what you think you own and control or how things are or totally in somebody else's hands, which they have selfish wants and needs there and not really doing it for the benefit of the community, even though like yeah. to pretend that they might be like Reddit. Which is the worst part. Yeah. So, yeah, but Let's see. But anyways, man, I got to go uh, spritz yep. those pork shoulders and, and attend go. to their needs. I'm going to go lead Podia since Jason and Jamie are both out. Yeah. It's all up to you now. Yeah. I'm, I'm this is your now. chance to force push as much as you want. <laughs> no, I think Jamie said he was listening to the podcast while he's on sabbatical and I don't want to admit anything. So let's just like end it right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We won't. This I have not force pushed. Episode. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. No, cut it. Cut it. <laughs>